Part 3. The Seductive Process Most of us understand that certain actions on our part will have a pleasing and seductive effect on the person we would like to seduce. The problem is that we are generally too self-absorbed. We may occasionally do something that is seductive, but often we follow this up with a selfish or aggressive action. We are in a hurry to get what we want, or unaware of what we are doing. We show a side of ourselves that is petty and banal, deflating any illusions or fantasies a person might have about us. Our attempts at seduction usually do not last long enough to create much of an effect. You will not seduce anyone by simply de depending on your engaging personality or by occasionally doing something noble or alluring. Seduction is a process that occurs over time. The longer you take and the slower you go, the deeper you will penetrate into the mind of your victim. The 24 chapters in this section will arm you with a series of tactics that will help you get out of yourself and into the mind of your victim so that you can play it like an instrument. The chapters are placed in a loose order, going from the initial contact with your victim to the successful conclusion. Because people's thoughts tend to revolve around their daily concerns and insecurities. You cannot proceed with a seduction until you slowly put their anxieties to sleep and fill their distant, distracted minds with thoughts of you. The opening chapters will help you accomplish this. There is a natural tendency in relationships for people to become so familiar with one another that boredom and stagnation sets in. You have to cons constantly surprise your victims, stir things up, even shock them. The middle and later chapters will instruct you in the art of alternating hope and despair, pleasure and pain, until your victims weaken and su succumb. All, at all costs, resist the temptation to hurry to the climax of your seduction, or to improvise. You are not being seductive, but selfish. Everything in daily life is hurried and improvised, and you need to offer something different. By taking your time and respecting the seductive process, you will not only break down your victim's resistance, you will make them fall in love. One, choose the right victim. Everything depends on the target of your seduction. Study your prey thoroughly and choose only those who will prove susceptible to your charm, to your charms. The right victims are those whom are for those whom you can fill a void, who see in you something exotic. They are often isolated or at least somewhat unhappy, perhaps because of recent adverse circumstances, or can easily be made so for the completely contented person is almost impossible to s s seduce. The perfect victim has some natural quality that attracts you. The strong emotions this quality inspires will help make your seductive maneuvers seem more natural and dynamic. The perfect victim allows for the perfect chase. Throughout life, we find ourselves having to persuade people to seduce them. Some will be relatively open to our influence, if only in subtle ways, while others seem impervious to our charms. Perhaps find this a mystery. Perhaps we find this a mystery beyond our control. But that is an ineffective way of dealing with life. Seducers prefer to pick the odds. 
as often as possible they go toward people who betray some vulnerability to them and avoid the ones who cannot be moved. To leave people who are inaccessible to you alone is a wise path. You cannot seduce everyone. On the other hand, you must actively hunt out the prey that responds the right way. How do you recognize your victims? By the way they respond to you. You should not pay so much attention to their conscious responses. A person who is obviously trying to please or charm you is probably playing to your vanity and wants something from you. Instead, pay greater attention to those responses outside conscious control, a blush, an invul involuntary mirroring of some gesture of yours, an unusual shyness, even perhaps a flash of anger or resentment. All of these show that you are having an effect on a person who is open to your influence. You can also recognize that you can also recognize the right targets by the effect they are having on you. Perhaps they make you uneasy. Perhaps they correspond to a deep-rooted childhood ideal or represent some kind of personal taboo that excites you. When a person has such a deep effect on you, it transforms all of your subsequent maneuvers. Your strong desire will infect the target and give them the dangerous sensation that they have a power over you. Never rush into the waiting arms of the first person who seems to like you. That is not seduction, but insecurity. The need that draws you will make for a low-level attachment, and interest on both sides will sag. Look at the types you have not considered before. That is where you will find challenge and adventure. Although the victim who is perfect for you depends on you, Certain types lend themselves to a more satisfying seduction. Just as it is hard to seduce a person who is happy, it is hard to seduce a person who has no imagination. People who are outwardly distant or shy are often better targets than extroverts. They are dying to be drawn out. People with a lot of time on their hands are extremely susceptible to seduction. They have mental space for you to fill. On the other hand, you should generally avoid people who are preoccupied with business or work. Seduction demands attention. And busy people have too little space in their minds for you to occupy. Your perfect victims are often people who think you have something they don't and who will be enchanted to have it provided for them. Such victims may have a temperament quite the opposite of yours, and this difference will create an exciting tension. Remember, a perfect victim is a person who stirs you in a way that cannot be explained in words. Be more creative in choosing your prey, and you will be rewarded with a more exciting seduction. Symbol. Big game. Lions are dangerous. To hunt them is to know the thrill of risk. Leopards are clever and swift, offering the excitement of a difficult chase. Never rush into the hunt. Know your prey and choose it carefully. Do not waste your time with small game. The rabbits that back into snares. The mink that walk into a scented trap. Challenge is pleasure. 2. Create a false sense of security. Approach indirectly. If you are too direct early on, you risk stirring up a resistance that will never be lowered. At first, there must be nothing of the seducer in your manner. The seduction should begin at an angle, indirectly, so that the target only gradually becomes aware of you. Haunt 
the periphery of your target's life, approach through a third party, or seem to cultivate a relatively neutral relationship, moving gradually from, a, from friend to lover. Arrange an occasional chance encounter, as if you and your target were destined to become acquainted. Nothing is more seductive than a sense of destiny. Lull the target into feeling secure, then strike. What you are after as a seducer is, to, is the ability to move people in the direction you want them to go. But the game is perilous. The moment they suspect they are acting under your influence, they will become resentful. We are creatures who cannot stand feeling that we are obeying someone's, someone else's will. Should your, should your targets ch catch on sooner or later, they will turn against you. But what if you make them do what you want them to do without their realizing it? What if they think they are in your in control? That is the power of indirection, and no seducer can work his or her magic without it. The first move to master is simple. Once you have chosen the right person, you must make the target come to you. If in the opening stages you can make your targets think that they are the ones making the first approach, you have won the, you have won the game. There will be no resentment, no persevere, no perverse counter-reaction, no paranoia. To make them come to you requires giving them space. This can be accomplished in several ways. You can haunt the periphery of their existence, letting them notice you in different places, but never approaching them. You will get their attention this way, and if they want to bridge the gap, they will have to come to you. You can play cat and mouse with them, first seeming interested, then stepping back, actively luring them to follow you into your web. Whatever you do and whatever kind of seduction you are practicing, you must at all costs avoid the natural tendency to crowd your targets. Do not make the mistake of thinking they will lose interest unless you apply pressure, or they will enjoy a flood of attention. Too much attention early on will actually just suggest insecurity and raise doubts as to your motives. Worst of all, it gives your targets no room for imagination. Take a step back. Let the thoughts you are provoking come to them as if they were their own. In the initial stages of a seduction, you must find ways to calm any sense of mistrust that the other person may experience. A. A, a sense of danger and fear can heighten the seduction later on, but if you stir such emotions in the first stages, you will more likely scare the target away. Often, the best way to seem harmless and to give yourself room to maneuver is to establish, relation, uh, is to establish a friendship. Moving steadily closer while always maintaining the distance appropriate for friends of the opposite sex. Your friendly conversations with your targets will bring you valuable information about their characters, their tastes, their weaknesses, their childhood yearnings that govern their adult behavior. In addition, by spending time with your targets, you can make them, you can make them comfortable with you, believing you are interested only in their thoughts, in their company, they will lower their resistance dissipating the usual tension between the sexes. Now, they are vulnerable, for your friendship with them has opened the golden gate to their body, their mind. At this point, any offhand comment, any slight physical contact, will spark a different thought, which will catch them off guard. Perhaps 
there could be something else between you. Once that feeling has stirred, they will wonder why you haven't made a move and will take the initiative themselves, enjoying the illusion that they are in control. There is nothing more effective in seduction than making the seduced think that they are the ones doing the seducing. Symbol. The spider's web. The spider finds an innocuous corner in which to spin its web. The longer the web takes, the more fabulous its construction, yet few really notice it. Its gossamer threads are nearly invisible. The spider has no need to chase for food or even to move. It, quite, it, it quietly sits in the corner waiting for its victims to come to it on their own and ensnare themselves in the web. 3. Send mixed signals. Once people are aware of your presence, and perhaps vaguely intrigued, you need to stir their interest before it settles on someone else. What is obvious and striking may attract their attention at first, but that attention is often short-lived. In the long run, ambiguity is much more potent. Most of us are much too obvious. Instead, be hard to figure out. Send mixed signals, both tough and tender, both spiritual and earthy, both innocent and cunning. A mix of qualities suggests depth, which fascinates even as it confuses. An elusive enigmatic aura will make people want to know more, drawing them into your circle. Create such a power by hinting at something contradictory within you. Nothing can proceed in seduction unless you can attract and hold your victim's attention, your physical presence becoming a haunting mental presence. It is actually quite easy to create that at first. Stir an alluring style of dress, a suggestive glance, something extreme about you. But what happens next? Our minds are barrage, barraged with images, not just from media, but from the disorder of daily life. And many of these images are quite striking. You become just one more thing screaming for attention. Your attractiveness will pass unless, you're, unless you spark the more enduring kind of spell that makes people think of you in your absence. That means engaging their imaginations, making them think there is more to you than what they see. Once they start embellishing your image with their fantasies, they are hooked. This must, however, be done early on, before your targets know too much and their impressions of you are set. It should occur the moment they lay eyes on you. By sending mixed signals in the first encounter, you create a little surprise, a little tension. You seem to be one thing, innocent, brash, brash intellectual, witty, but you also throw them a glimpse of something else, devilish, shy, spontaneous, sad. Keep things subtle. If the second quality is too strong, you will seem schizophrenic, but make them wonder why you might be shy or sad underneath your brash intellectual wit, and you will have their attention. Give them an, an ambiguity, ambiguity that lets them see what they want to see. Capture their imagination with little voyeuristic glimpses into your dark soul. To capture and hold attention, you need to show attributes that go against your physical appearance, creating depth and mystery. If you have a sweet face and an innocent air, let out hints of something dark, even vaguely cruel in your character. It is not 
advertised in your words, but in your manner. Do not worry if this under quality is a negative one, like danger, cruelty, or immorality. People will be drawn to the enigma anyway, and, pre- and pure goodness is rarely seductive. Remember, no one is naturally mysterious, at least not for long. Mystery is something you have to work at, a ploy on your part, and something that must be used early on in the seduction. Playing with gender roles is a kind of intriguing paradox that has a long history in seduction. The greatest Don Juans have had a touch of prettiness and femininity, and the most attractive courtesans have had a masculine streak. The strategy, though, is only powerful when the underquality is merely hinted at. If the mix is too obvious or striking, it will seem bizarre or even threatening. A potent variation on this theme is the blending of physical heat and emotional coldness. Dandies like Hugh Burrell, Brumel, and Andy Warhol combine striking physical appearances with a kind of coldness of manner a distance from everything and everyone. They are both enticing and elusive, and people spend lifetimes chasing after such men, trying to shatter their unattainability, the power of apparently unattainable unattainable people is devilishly seductive. We want to be the one to break them down. They also wrap themselves in ambiguity, and mystery, either so, either either talking very little or talking only of surface matters, hinting at a depth of character you can never reach. Perhaps you have a reputation for a particular quality which immediately which immediately comes to mind when people see you. You will better hold their attention by suggesting that behind this reputation some other quality lies lurking. No one had a darker, more sinful reputation than Lord Byron. What drove women wild was that behind this somewhat cold and disdainful exterior, they could sense that he he was actually quite romantic, even spiritual. Byron played this up with his melancholic ears and occasional kind deed. Transfixed and confused, many people, many women, thought that they could be the one to lead him back to goodness, to make him a faithful lover. Once a woman entertained such a thought, she was completely under his spell. It is not difficult to create such a seductive effect. Should you be known as imminent imminently rational, say, hint at something irrational. These principles have applications far beyond sexual seduction. To hold the attention of a broad public to seduce them into thinking about you, you need to mix your signals. Display too much of one quality, even if it is a noble one, like knowledge or efficiency, and people will feel that you lack humanity. We are all complex and ambiguous, full of contradictory impulses. If you show only one side, even if it is your good side, you will wear on people's nerves. This will suspect you as, this will suspect you, they will suspect you are a hypocrite. A bright surface may have a decorative charm, but what draws your eye into a painting is a depth of field, an inexpressible ambiguity, a surreal complexity. Symbol. The the theatre curtain. On stage, the curtain's heavy, deep red folds attracts your eye with their hypnotic surface. 
But what really fascinates and draws you in is what you think might be happening behind the curtain. The light peeking through, the, suggest the suggestion of a secret, something about to happen. You feel the thrill of a voyeur about to watch a performance. Four, appear to be an object of desire, create triangles. Few are drawn to the person whom others avoid or neglect. People gather around those who have already attracted interest. We want what other people want. To draw your victims closer and make them hungry to possess you, you must create an aura of desirability, of being wanted and courted by many. It will become a point of vanity for them to be the preferred object of your attention, to win you away from a crowd of admirers. Manufacture the illusion of popularity by surrounding yourself with members of the opposite sex, friends, former lovers, present suitors. Create triangles that stimulate rival rivalry and raise your value. Build a reputation that precedes you. If many have succumbed to your charms, there must be a reason. We are social creatures and are immensely influenced by the tastes and desires of other people. Imagine a large social gathering. You see a man alone whom nobody talks to for any length of time and who is wandering around without company. Isn't there a kind of self fulfilling isolation about him? Why is he alone? Why is he avoided? There has to be a reason. Unless someone takes pity on this man and starts up a conversation with him, he will look unwanted and unwantable. But over there, in another corner, is a woman surrounded by people. They laugh at her remarks, and as they laugh, others join the group, attracted by its gaiety. When she moves around, people follow. Her face is glowing with attention. There has to be a reason. In both cases, of course, there doesn't actually have to be a reason at all. The neglected man may have quite charming qualities, supposing you ever talk to them, but most likely you won't. Desirability is a social illusion. Its source is less what is less what you say or do or any kind of boasting or self-advertisement than the sense that other people desire you. To turn your target's interest into something deeper, into desire, you must make them see. You must make them see you as a person whom others cherish and covet. Make people compete for your attention. Make them see you as sought after by everyone else. The aura of desirability will envelop you. Your admirers can be friends or even suitors. Call it the harem effect. Pauline Bonaparte, sister of Napoleon, raised her value in men's eyes by always having a group of worshipful people, worshipful men around her at balls and parties. If she went for a walk, it was never with one man, always with two or three. Perhaps these men were simply friends, or even just props and hangers on. The sight of them was enough to suggest that she was prized and desired, a woman worth fighting over. Andy Warhol, too, surrounded himself with the most glamorous, interesting people he could find. To be part of his inner circle meant that you were desirable as well. By placing himself in the middle, but keeping himself aloof from it all, he made everyone compete for his attention. He stirred people's desire to possess him by holding back. Practices, practices like these not only stimulate competitive, competitive desires, they take, him, they, they take aim at people's prime weakness, their vanity and self-esteem. We can endure feeling that another person has more talent and, or more money 
but the sense that a rival is more desirable than we are is that is unbearable. In the early 18th century, the Duke de Richelieu, a great, a great rake, managed to seduce a young woman who was rather religious, but whose husband, adult, was often away. He then proceeded to seduce her upstairs neighbor, a young widow. When the two women discovered that he was going from one to the other in the same night, they confronted him. A lesser man would have fled, but not the duke. He understood the dynamic of vanity and desire. Neither woman wanted to feel that he preferred the other, and so he managed to arrange a little menage, a trice, knowing that now they would struggle between themselves to be the favorite. When people's vanity is at risk, you can make them do whatever you want. According to Stendhal, if there is a woman you are interested in, pay attention to her sister. That will stir a triangular desire. Your reputation, your illustrative, your, your illustrish, illustrious part past as a seducer is an effective way of creating an aura of desirability. Women threw themselves at Errol Flynn's feet, not because of his handsome face and certainly not because of his acting skills, but because of his reputation. They knew that other women had found him irresistible. Once he had established that reputation, he did not have to chase women anymore. They came to him. Your own reputation may not be so alluring, but you must find a way to suggest to your victim that others, many others, have found you desirable. It is reassuring. There is nothing like a restaurant full of empty tables to persuade you not to go in. A variation on the triangle strategy is the use of contrast. Careful exploitation of people who are dull or unattractive may enhance your desirability by comparison. At a social affair, for instance, make sure that your target has to chat with the most boring person available. Come to the rescue and your target will be delighted to see you. To make use of contrasts, either develop and display those attractive attributes, humor, vivacity, and so on, that are the scary, the scarcest in your own social group, and choose a group in which your natural qualities are rare and will shine. The use of contrast has vast political ramifications for a political figure must also seduce and seem desirable. Learn to play up the qualities that your rivals lack. In the American presidential race of 1980, the irresoluteness of Jimmy Carter made the single-mindedness of Ronald Reagan look desirable. Contrasts are eminently seductive because they do not depend on your own words or self-advertisements. The public reads them unconsciously and sees what is and sees what it wants to see. Finally, appearing to be desired by others will raise your value, but often how you carry yourself can influence this as well. Do not let your targets see you are. Do not let your targets see you so often. Keep your distance. Seem unattainable, out of their reach. An object that is rare and hard to obtain is generally more prized. Symbol: the trophy. What makes you want to win the trophy, and to see it as something worth having, is the sight of the other competitors. Some out of a spirit 
of kindness may want to reward everyone for trying, but the trophy then loses its value. It must represent not only your victory, but everyone else's defeat. Five. Five. Create a need. Stir an anxiety and discontent. A perfectly satisfied person cannot be seduced. Tension and disharmony must be instilled in your target's mind. Stir within them, stir within them feelings of discontent and and, hub, and unhappiness with their circumstances and with themselves. Their life lacks adventure. They have strayed from the ideals of their youth. They have become boring. The feelings of inadequacy that you create will give you space to insinuate yourself, to make them see you as the answer to their problems. Pain and anxiety, pain and anxiety are the proper precur precursors to pleasure. Learn to manufacture the need that you can fill. Everyone wears a mask in society. We pretend to be more sure of ourselves than we are. We do not want other people to glimpse that doubting self within us. In truth, our egos and personalities are much more fragile than they appear to be. They cover up feelings of confusion and emptiness. As a seducer, you must never mistake a person's appearance for the reality. People are always susceptible to being seduced. Because, in fact, everyone lacks a sense of completeness, feels something missing deep inside. Bring their doubts and anxieties to the surface, and they can be led and lured to follow you. No one can see you as someone to follow or fall in love with, or fall in love with unless they first reflect on themselves somehow and on what they are missing. Before the seduction proceeds, you must place a mirror in front of them in which they glimpse that inner emptiness. Made aware of a lack, they now can focus on you as the person who can fill that empty space. Remember, most of us are lazy. To, re to relieve our feelings of boredom or inadequacy, on our own takes too much effort. Letting someone else do the job is both easier and more exciting. The desire to have someone fill up our emptiness is the weakness on which all seducers prey. Make people anxious about, their fu about the future. Make them depressed. Make them question their identity. Make them sense the boredom that gnaws at their life. The ground is prepared. The seeds of seduction can be sown. Your task as a seducer is to create a wound in your victim, aiming at their soft spot, the, the chink in their self-esteem. They are stuck in a rut. Make them feel it more deeply, innocently bringing it up and talking about it. What you want is an... Um, Insecurity you can expand, expand a little. An anxiety that can best be re relieved by involvement with another person, namely you. They must feel the wound before they fall in love. In your role of seducer, try to position yourself as coming from outside, as a stranger of sorts. You represent change, difference, a breakup of routines. The lure of the exotic. Make your victim feel, make your victims feel that by comparison their lives are boring and their friends less interesting than they had thought. Remember, people prefer to feel that if their life is uninteresting. It is not because of themselves, but because of their circumstances. The dull people they know, the town 
into which they were born. Once you make them feel the lure of the exotic, seduction is easy. Another devilishly seductive area to aim at is the victim's past. To grow old is to renounce. It's to renounce or compromise youthful ideals, to become less spontaneous, less alive in a way. This knowledge lies dormant in all of us. As a seducer, you must bring it to the surface, make it clear how far people have strayed from their past goals and ideals. You, in turn, present yourself as representing that ideal, as offering a chance to recapture lost youth through adventure, through seduction. Old age is constantly seduced by youth, but first, the youth, the, but first, the young people must make it clear what the older ones are missing, how they have lost their ideals. Only then will they feel that the presence of the young will let them recapture the spark, the rebellious spirit that age and society have conspired to repress. This concept has infinite applications. Corporations and politicians know that they cannot seduce their public into buying what they want them to buy or doing what they want them to do unless they first awaken a sense of need and discontent. Make the, mass, make the masses uncertain about their identity and you can help define it for them. It is as true of groups or nations as it is of individuals. They cannot be seduced without being made to feel some lack. Part of John F. Kennedy's election strategy in 1960 was to make Americans unhappy about the 1950s and how far the country has strayed from its ideals. In talking about the 50s, he did not mention the nation's economic stability or its emergence as a superpower. Instead, he implied that the period was marked by conformity, a lack of risk and adventure, a loss of our frontier values. To vote for Kennedy was to embark on a collective adventure, to go back to ideals we had given up. But before anyone joined his crusade, he, they had to be made aware of how much they had lost, what was missing. A group, like an individual, can get mired in routine, losing track of its original goals. Too much prosperity saps it of strength. You can seduce an entire nation by aiming at its collective insecurity, that latent sense that not everything is what it seems, stirring dis dissatisfaction with the present and reminding people about the glorious past can unsettle their sense of identity. Then you can be the one to redefine it, a grand seduction. Symbol, Cupid's arrow. What awakens desire in the seduced is not a soft touch or a pleasant sensation. It is a wound. The arrow creates a pain, an ache, a need for relief. Before desire, there must be pain. Aim the arrow at the victim's weak, weakest spot, creating a wound that you can open and reopen.